Okay, we are live. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the Black Aces panel. I am hosting, I'm Yasmin Benoit, British model, aromantic asexuality activist, and board member of AVEN. Um, I've often hosted um, an ace and ethnicity panel at these conferences, but in contrast to last year's, I wanted to do something that was specifically focused on black aces from different parts of the world, because that's an experience that I feel like isn't highlighted enough and it's one that's true to my own. Obviously, this is an international conference, so we've had a whole bunch of different panels for Asian, for Native American, and all kinds of other ethnicities. But yeah, this one is is pretty specific. Um, I navigate the asexual community and media spaces as a Black woman, and this year I felt more comfortable speaking about that intersection in a more honest way. I've become more conscious of the ways that Blackness intersects with asexuality, not just when you're navigating the community, but also in the ways that you're perceived outside of it. So I wanted to get that perspective from Black aces from different parts of the world. Um, there was initially meant to be a few more panelists. We might get Janessa from Nigeria depends on her internet connection as to whether she'll be in this. Originally, I was also going to have Mikhail from Trinidad and Tobago, but he wasn't able to be here. So we have some American aces. We have me from the UK, and we also have one from Brazil. So I was going to introduce all of our panelists to you. First of all, we have Sharonda J. Brown, who uses she they pronouns. She's Southern grown, which means for anyone who isn't um, that familiar, that means from the South of the United States. <laughs> um, is an essayist, editor, storyteller with a focus on media analysis and cultural critique, currently serving as the editor in chief of Wear Your Voice magazine. In addition to writing and thinking about asexuality, their special interests include blackness and queerness and horror narratives. And Sharonda is actually one of the first other black aces that I stumbled across on Twitter, so it's very awesome to have them here. And similarly, the same goes for Marshall. John, I'm totally gonna mispronounce your surname, by the way. Is it Blount? Um, Blount. Blount, oh my God, not Blount. Sorry, that's the most British way to say that. Blount uh, is an asexual activist based out of Erie, Pennsylvania. I hope it's pronounced Erie. Um, Marshall also serves as a board member of Asexual Outreach, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to empower and strengthen ace communities across the United States and Canada. Um, I believe he's also a member of the Pennsylvania Commission on LGBTQ Affairs, right? Correct. And he has a very cool YouTube channel that you should totally check out. Um, and finally, assuming that Janessa doesn't appear, we also have Lahane Martins, hopefully I'm pronouncing your surname right, who uses she they pronouns, is a black ace activist all the way from Brazil and is also part of a non-binary activist group called Combe. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right too. So thank you all for being here and hopefully giving us quite a diverse perspective for this panel. Uh, for those in the audience, we were going to start by, I was gonna ask the panelists some kind of more um, general questions and some specific ones. And at the end, I was going to take some questions from you. So definitely keep sending them into Slido. And then you can ask, well, not just the panelists, you can ask me as well, but I guess more focused on the panelists. Um, so to go in the order in which you happen to appear on the screen, um, actually, I wanted to start, um, you know, I'm gonna go for the general ones. So for everybody, how do you think that your asexuality has impacted, how is your asexuality perceived within your ethnic communities um, and as being African-American, as being Afro-Brazilian? How do you think that's perceived in your respective areas? Me first. Sure, on my screen okay. you're next to me so we can go in that order. Okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm fortunate enough to know and know of a lot of Black ace people um, in the States, a lot of whom, actually, all of whom I think I met before I knew they were ace or before they even knew they were ace. So my experience um, has been that I 
have seen a lot more non-Black people questioning the validity or possibility of the existence of Black asexuality than I have seen Black people do it. And this isn't to say that um, acephobia doesn't come from Black people, because it absolutely does. But I, in my experience, it's never been the Black people can't be asexual brand of acephobia that comes from Black people. It comes from non-Black people, in my experience. That's so interesting that you that the first that you've managed to meet so many other black cases. I mean, I didn't meet any other black cases for a long time. Um, from the time of which I realized I was asexual to the time I met actual black cases was probably almost like a decade <laughs> time span. Oh. So, that's, uh, so that's really cool that you had that opportunity to do that. Um, Lohani, how about you? Well, my experience is that Black women are so hypersexualized that we don't even have the chance of not having sex with someone. And that, as Sharonda said, it doesn't come from the Black community. It comes from non-Black people. And it's weird because we are seen just as bodies. So people just come to us to have sex and they don't even get uh, give us the chance of thinking about our sexual attraction. Like for me, is it really just started my coming out process. Like I didn't have the chance of thinking, oh, do I really feel sexual attraction for the, per for the person? Oh, I just want to be, you know, to feel uh, beautiful and valued. I don't know. And uh, for me, it's hard to talk about that because people just assume that I am hypersexual just because I'm a black woman. Have you found that do other black Brazilians is asexuality a conversation that's kind of happening over there in the kind of amongst black Brazilians? Is that something that like people within that community kind of understand or is it not really, or is a conversation not really there yet? Yeah, people don't know about asexuality in Brazil as a whole. Like, it's a new conversation in uh, in Brazil and in America Latina in general. Like, now we have these activist groups uh, in Brazil and in America Latina, but uh, people don't know about that. And we have to explain from the, from the very beginning so people can understand. But uh, when it comes to black people, in my experience, uh, just the fact that I explain like, oh, this is a sexuality, they just don't question me. They don't think it's weird or bizarre. They just accept me because a lot of them feel the same way. A lot of my black friends feel the same way as me because, you know, I just accidentally uh, surrounded myself with LGBTQ uh, people all of my ta all my life, and now I just have LGBTQ LGBTQ friends. I mean, that's lovely. It's great to, to mm -hmm. hear multiple people say about how kind of accepted it's been in their own individual communities. What about you, Marshall? What is it kind of like in the kind of African Amer American community where where you live? Unfortunately, I think um, like it took me leaving like my community to find more uh, find black ace people. Um, uh, my area basically is essentially like it's like it's almost like a some people just view sexuality as just like like just from two points and that's it. Um, and when I do bring up my sexuality in like black spaces in my community, it gets perceived as like sometimes oh um it's like a new thing and instead of something that's been around since the beginning of um beginning of humanity um it's definitely something that has affected my navigation of this um of, of spaces here as a, as a black asexual person uh, within black spaces because it's always viewed as something um new or and i often do get, get the experience that um some people view asexuality as a white thing as opposed to um, just something that any, anyone could be. Yes, it's, it's interesting because I mean, I'm, I'm British, my ancestry is from the Caribbean. So a lot of the kind of, particularly in terms of like, you know, like my parents, friends, and like those kinds of demographics, most of the black people I encounter tend to be either kind of 
immigrants from the Caribbean in the UK or sometimes African immigrants in the UK, and they tend to be quite religious demographics. Um, and conversations about queerness aren't really that common in them. I guess particularly for me being in a town outside of a main city that is for a kind of whiter area. Um, and I, I definitely, I feel like, I know, I feel like the conversation about asexuality hasn't really reached the black community much where I am. I think people labor interpret it as being kind of like well-behaved and therefore they kind of mm. consolidate the idea that way because they think, okay, well, you're not exhibiting behaviors that I would disagree with as a lifestyle. But then when you frame it in a queer way, then it kind of becomes weirder. I think a lot of people aren't entirely sure of what to make of it really. But it's interesting to hear about how that can differ depending on like whereabouts you are, um, which kind of leads to one of my questions that I asked, that I had actually kind of for Sharonda and Marshall, since you're both American, but Sharonda, you said you're from the South and Marshall's from up North in Pennsylvania, but Marshall, you also mentioned that you have family in the South. Do you feel like the um, kind of awareness around asexuality differs depending on which part of the United States you're in? Because people often, when we think about countries that kind of have a lot of awareness in like English speaking countries, they tend to say the UK and the US. But when I've worked within the US, if I'm speaking at a university in California versus one in Arkansas, it's kind of a different energy. So for you guys, do you think that there is a, that there is a difference or do you think it's kind of nationally equal in terms of awareness? So I do want to clarify that I don't go outside and do things like even pre-pandemic. I wasn't <laughs> spending time in actual physical communities. It was mostly online communities. Um, so I can't say regionally specific how black folks here um, or in my area feel about asexuality. I am a North Carolinian, um, so I'm in the Bible Belt. Um, so I imagine that a lot of people will probably hear it also think uh, similarly to the way that um, your family does that it's more rooted in purity culture and like morality than it is an actual like orientation. Um, but I will say that last year, I think there was a, a study that found that there are more queer people in the South in the US than there are like in, in the North and in the uh, Western part of the country. So it, um, I would hope that <laughs> the South would have um, would reflect that that level of queerness and the acceptance of asexuality as a form of queerness. But honestly, I don't know, um, especially because populations in the U.S. are a lot more dense in certain states than there are in others. Like there are states in the Midwest that are hardly having people in them, <laughs> and your your nearest neighbor is like three miles away. Um, I imagine it differs based on whether or not you are in a rural area or urban area, whether or not you have like um, queer advocacy groups there, what type of education you might have there, but I really can't say for sure. It's, it's definitely something, because I am I do border the Midwest like by 30 miles, so mm -hmm. I get the best of both worlds unfortunately, sometimes unfortunately. Um, I think there is more in a sense that we do get a lot of the same things from the South because a lot of, a lot of um, the black community in my city descends from people who who came in the Great Migration from the South in the 19, like from 1900 to the 1900s. So, it, it, we do get the same, uh, like the very religious, very like, like sometimes like sometimes people like the past in that, in that sense. Um, but. Yeah, it just, it just, it just, it just Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've, I'm quite familiar with North Carolina. I've kind of seen it. I know it's a southern state, but I've kind of seen it as being on like a sort of threshold between like, I don't know, I know it's got kind of a lot of universities there. It's got a kind of surfer vibe in some parts, some kind of rural vibes in some other parts. So I've always yeah. kind of been sort of like a kind of in between. I don't know, seem like a kind of cultural sort of in between, but there's definitely a stereotype that, you know, the Southern states are going to be more conservative and probably less aware of that kind of thing. And then up north or nearer like New York or the coast is going to be a kind of different vibe. So that's interesting. And similarly for Lohani, um, 
in my observation, I think Brazil's in a kind of interesting place from an outsider's perspective, because on one hand, like your Brazil is known for having some of like the biggest pride festivals, like of all time. And I feel like I could probably, I feel like there's quite a few kind of celebrities in Brazil that are like openly asexual that I've, that I've seen anyway. Um, at least in the kind of like reality kind of TV kind of area. Um, but at the same time, you have a, a president who is, is not like the biggest advocate for that kind of thing. So how does the, how does asexuality kind of fall under the queer umbrella in, in Brazil? And like, how is it kind of interpreted by the country now that it's becoming more kind of well-known? Well, as you said, we have a president right now that it's, totally anti-queer and that encourage a lot of people to be anti-queer too, like members of our own family. So we had to protect ourselves and we had to come to Oh. Oh, we'll give it a, we'll give it a second, see if she pops back again. Give her a second. Hopefully she'll come back. Um, see, because I don't want to like move on in case she comes back in like a second. I don't want to cut off what could be a very interesting answer to the <laughs> to the question. But again, in the meantime, I'm just seeing some of the comments that everyone is sharing. Thank you for tuning in. We've obviously got quite a few Americans here, which yeah. is cool. Someone else from Pennsylvania, I've got someone else from Brazil. So that's really cool. Um, oh, no, I think, I think, I think she might be gone. So, I mean, if she pulls back, I'll ask the question again and then we can, we can try that again. But in the meantime, I guess I'll um, move on to a, I guess I'll start with a kind of specific question, I guess, that you could probably both answer, actually, um, speaking about, we kind of touched upon the topic of hypersexualization, and I've always had a theory that the kind of hypersexualization of Black people in that standard, but also particularly on Black men, is probably one of the reasons why you don't see, so it's harder to find Black ace guys than it is some other demographics. I always had a theory that it has something to do with that, but I would love to hear, um, oh, wait, Lahan's back. All right, hold on. Sorry. I'm sorry, You're guys. Right. I'm just trying my best to keep it going. That's okay. That's okay. Oh, we can, okay, we can go back to your question then, if you can still answer that. I can repeat it if you want to. Uh, no, I, I remember the question. And so in Brazil, we have the highest like uh, trans people, you know, murdering in the world. Like, uh, it's weird because as you said, we have one of the biggest uh, pride events in the world, but at the same time, people reject us so much that we have to like scream all the time that we are here and we want to be respected and that's all. But it's different for each people because I am ace, but non-binary too. But uh, in society, I'm read as a cis woman. So uh, even though I, Yes, I suffer from racism and things like that and misogyny. I don't suffer from, you know, transphobia all the time. Like people often um, misgender me with my pronouns and things like that, but that people don't, you know, will kill me just because I'm no non-binary. Like, uh, of course, non-binary people I, are violated here too, but not like um, as a trans woman, you know, and uh, um, people at the same time that they reject like queer people, they end like off in the shadows. They, you know, they look for trans woman, they look for gay man. And it's, it's weird because you see that it's um, something that people reject in themselves. So they reject it in other people. And in the Bolsonaro family, which is the, the family of our president, there's like 
two two of his sons are gay, but they don't really speak about that. And even though I'm speaking about that, but people just, you know, they just hide it from everyone. And he's one of his sons just um, talked bad about him in a live in a stream while he was playing. And Bolsonaro just um, prohibited that him to do that, to speak bad about him. So it's weird because you see they reject it in themselves, but we just want to be respected too. Um, it, it's been hard to queer people to exist in this pandemic and with, with this government, but we are trying our best to survive. But um, a lot of things happening in Brazil specifically in LGBTQ community. Oh, oh, I think I think they kind of got to the end of their answer. Hopefully, thank if you can still hear me. Thank you for your answer. Um, I guess while while we see if if Lohani can come back, we can kind of go back to the question I was I was framing before, which was kind of on the subject of um, yeah, I, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like you, you I kind of it. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for I your answer. Although, although I was curious to follow up specifically about you know how asexuality fits into kind of like the movements going on in Brazil. Is it quite openly included under that umbrella? Is it kind of are people like open to it being part of that conversation? Because ace phobia within the LGBTQ plus community is definitely something that I see like kind of in British spaces or American spaces. But I was curious as to what it's like in Brazil. Well, um, from LGBTQ community, like ace people still suffer a lot of ace phobia. No, Nikki, oh. oh no. Okay, oh, back. No, so um ace people still suffer a lot of ace phobia. Even from LGBTQ plus people because uh they don't really understand like not why we are like that, but they just how can you not feel sexual attraction and there's some people that say it's just a uh, reality, it's not a real sexuality, and we we should stop trying to make this a sexuality. Even oh, I'll give it a second. She might pop back again like she did just then. But it definitely sounds like the, the the rhetoric is ironically similar, whether you're in the UK, the US, or even or even South America. Um, <laughs> that's how the Brazilian government is trying to cut Lahadi's internet. Hopefully, we're not being that controversial here. Um, okay, I'll give her a second and see if she pops back. But if not, then I'll probably move on to the other question, and then um, they can join in. Hopefully, with that. Um, I give it a second. I can see it. she's still here. Um, okay, I guess I'll. Oh, yay! <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Okay, it's, it's still falling, but okay. And uh, yeah, it, it's hard. And we have to, as I said, explain it from the very beginning so people can understand us. But it's been hard to be accepted in the LGBTQ community from Brazil. But I, I, I don't know, I kind of understand why people feel that way because it's just because they don't understand it. Even though I try to explain and let them know who we are, but um, it's hard, you know, even ex especially in these times where LGBTQ people in Brazil is, are suffering so much. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And I was saying it's ironic how 
I guess over here in the UK, the US, or even all the way in South America, the rhetorics is still very much similar when it comes to how people understand asexuality. But one question I have, which I guess is kind of for everyone, but I definitely wanted to probably start with Marshall with this question, when I frame it specifically about, um, it can be hard to find black ace guys, um, but sure not because they don't exist, but just because it's harder to find those that are like openly and loudly out enough for you then to be able to kind of get them for things, um, which I always theorized had something to do with the hypersexualization of black people, but particularly black men and its association with masculinity. And that maybe that's why it's harder to find like black guys that are openly and proudly ace. But I was definitely curious to get your perspective on that, Marshall. Yeah, it's definitely something that um, that we go through, um, um, especially in a society where we're viewed as like uh, as a hypersexualized, and um, it's kind of like one of those things where we are expectations in the sense that we're supposed to have fa like supposed to have families, we're supposed to um, get uh, get married, etc. So going against that, you get like a lot of pushback from your family or your social circle circle so that's how it kind of was like my mom and my dad's always been supportive for instance but you do have people in your family who are very like who are very like oh um i expected you to do this or that and i do feel like black uh ace men go through that and often and it's often the reason why we are not out as um like everyone else like we our expectations, not um, not human beings like everyone else. Yeah, and what did I guess I think we've all um, Lohani kind of touched upon the way that like the hypersexualization had impacted uh, their journey. Um, Sharonda, how do you feel like? Do you feel like it's kind of intersected with your experience as well? Yeah, for sure. Um, the thing about hypersexualization is that not only does it write a particular narrative onto you, but it also comes with an expectation for you to align with that narrative. Um, so there are these myths, these centuries old myths um, about black asexuality or black sexuality itself as being savage and uncontrollable. And for black people who are read and perceived as women, especially there's an expectation to always be sexually available and sexually accessible. And when you fail to meet that expectation, when you refuse that narrative, the response is usually anger and resistance from people who have written that narrative onto you. Um, because you are shattering their understanding of race and sexuality. And accepting a Black asexuality would mean that they would have to dismantle and then release their monolithic view of Blackness and, and sex. And a lot of people don't want to let go of racist sexual stereotypes because they're comforted by them. And I don't mean just like racial fetishes. I mean, that there are people who are comforted by the myth of black savage se sexuality because they're comforted by anti-blackness. And for a lot of people, anti-blackness is central to their worldview because Anti-blackness is what affords them their value and their worthiness in a society that is anti-black um, because all others define themselves against blackness as being antithetical to blackness. So what black, sex, black asexuality does is threatens to upend everything that these people think that they know about blackness and about sex and how we relate to and engage in sex. It threatens their worldview, which means that it ultimately threatens their world. And hypersexuality is at the center of all of that. So I, I really think that that is a huge barrier to people saying black asexuality is something that is real and valid. Yes, definitely. It's one of those things where I think I've kind of started to encounter it more online, particularly recently, particularly from white people in the way that kind of I am perceived when I speak about asexuality, I often get very kind of weirdly, aggressively sexual, angry reactions um, and this kind of weird ingrained 
urge to sexualize, even if I'm just sitting here as I am right now, people will say, well, your face is sexual, your hair is sexual, your ankle is sexual. Anything you're doing is inherently sexual and therefore you can't be asexual no matter what you're doing. And I'm, I assume it's probably just because I'm, I'm a black woman and that's why they're immediately seeing it through an incredibly sexual lens, whether anything sexual is happening or not, just because they've just kind of, it's like learned behavior and an ancient stereotype at that point, um, at this point. Um, it kind of leads on to another question I kind of had for everybody. I think um, Shawna kind of touched upon it a little bit when you mentioned like about how you fortunately had managed to encounter quite a lot of black case people earlier on, but I was wondering what was everyone's kind of first encounter with the asexual community like? I mean, for me, it was predominantly online. Seemed very white when I was seeing things online. In person, I think I met two asexual people in person in about a, I don't know, like a five year time span. <laughs> um, and and they were both white as well. So it definitely felt like a very kind of white space. I still feel like it is a kind of loudly white space when you're kind of existing on different social media platforms. And most of our encounters do end up being social media based, but it, I'd be curious to know what your kind of first encounters with the asexual community were like, whether it was in person or offline. For, for me, it was, um... It, when I first came out, I did go search for like online groups on Facebook. Um, that was my first initial like encounter with the with fellow ace people. Um, but it was predominantly uh, white, um, and I unfortunately had to leave a group because of of, of racism. Um, the admins would not do anything to address it, so I just left. And as a result, uh, a black ace person made a like a space where it was ran by um fellow black uh uh like bipoc ace, ace folk um but i didn't meet another ace person at a women's march back in 2017. uh i was wearing a homemade uh ace button and we spot each other in the, in the crowd so it was kind of like a movie where he's kind of like <laughs> Oh, like you're, you're asexual too, and it's just like you know, it's just like it's like it's it's like, it's like a rush of a rush of excitement when you meet someone that's just like you because you feel like you are often alone. Like right now, like I feel like this is the first time in like a few weeks that I've spoken to ace uh, ace people via video. That's how that's how isolating it is here. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is one of the few occasions where I have the opportunity to speak to black. I mean, I get to speak to ace people quite a lot, but speaking to black ace people is kind of a different a different story. But Sharonda, what was kind of your like first encounters like? <laughs> so my first foray into asexuality was actually a documentary. I saw the asexual documentary about David J that came out in like 2011. But I didn't see it until about 2013 or 2014 when I was in grad school. And so then, I, because I'm a giant nerd, I started doing research <laughs> on it. Um, and then like a few years later is where I um, found, I think Tumblr maybe was the first place where I started to read from like other ace people's perspectives. Um, and then from there, it was just following ace pages on different social media platforms. But I have always been more of an observer than I think a participant. Um, I get invited to ace groups, but I don't really, I, I like to read what people have to say and really digest what people have to say rather than participate in the conversations because I'm a writer. So I'd rather write an article and get everything in my brain out onto paper than to have actual real-time conversations because I'm also an introvert. And so like I have a huge internal world and it helps me to think through things a lot before um, I speak about them. Um, but I don't, like I said, I know a lot of ace, black ace people and I have actually met some in real life after having met them online first, but I don't spend time in like physical ace spaces. But I, I think that if I did, I, it would it wouldn't be too difficult to find black aces um but i agree with what you said yes i mean a lot of asexual spaces online are overwhelmingly white <laughs> and it can be sort of 
um, unwelcoming and like a culture shock, or maybe not a culture shock, but you don't really feel like you mesh because white culture is so different from black culture. Um, even in the diaspora, like <laughs> it, it just looks so different. So having white, having a spaces be so overwhelming, overwhelmingly white can prevent a lot of black and other people of color from showing up in those spaces. Yes, I think it's one of those things where I think for me, it kind of the reason I started doing this in the first place was because I kind of felt like I personally could not empathize much with a lot of the kind of age representation available, whether it was like a TV show or whether it was just, I don't know, who's the popular YouTuber at the moment, who's the popular blogger at the moment mm -hmm. or whatever. Because I was like, I feel like this is it's not the same thing. I just didn't really, I found it kind of hard to kind of empathize and that's kind of why I just didn't really see myself reflected in a lot of the things. And I knew that my asexuality was kind of perceived differently because I was black, because I kind of had that, you know, in my in my daily life. Oh, the hands back. Hold on. I'll just have them back. Hello. Hello. <laughs> oh, we were actually we were just talking about um like your kind of first your first encounters with the asexual community and asexual people, whether it was online or in person and kind of like your first impressions, what were yours like? Uh, my impression of the asexual community, um, I found really good people at first, at the first sight, um, but at the same way, I, I don't know in other countries, but in Brazil, there's a lot of these moral is asexual people that like no sex is so bad like we can't talk about that because it's dirty and it's wrong a lot of these asexual I, I unfortunately found a lot of these asexual people too but um hopefully i could you know just filter the the asexual people around me and they they helped me so much like to know myself, to get to know myself and to find out that I am asexual too. And, you know, here in Brazil, um, the fact that uh, the asexuality is something new in Brazil um, makes us, you know, surrounded ourselves with uh, asexual people to feel safe you know, to fight against asphobia. So yes, it my my first impression of the asexual community was really, really good, to be honest. It's interesting. I feel like I spoke into another Brazilian, but I don't know whether it was on a, this kind of panel or it was on something, but they actually said the same thing about the kind of moralistic thing in some like Brazilian A circles. So I've definitely heard that before. So that's, it's interesting. It's a, I guess it's a, I, I haven't encountered that much in the UK. I guess maybe, I guess it's like a cultural difference, but that's quite interesting. Is it, I guess, cause I mean, the racial demographics of Brazil is pretty different to probably where, where I'm yeah. from. Was, there, was it kind of like racially diverse when you encountered um, the ace community in Brazil or not really? Like in Brazil, we have all kinds of people, like all kinds of people when mm -hmm. I say that it's literally, you can, anyone can be Brazilian, to be honest. And in the asexual community, it's like that too. Like, uh, I, f I find a lot of diversity in the asexual community. So I could relate to them uh, easily than, you know, in the rest of the <laughs> LGBTQ community. Um, because our experiences are so different, but at the same time, we are connected by the asexuality. So we can talk about anything, anything. So um, about the moralistic thing about <laughs> the asexual community in Brazil, it's because um, even though we we pretend that we don't have a, a specifically religion, like in the government, we are we are the one of the most Catholic and uh, countries in the world, so the Christian is uh, the Christianism is really really strong here, and it affects our lives in like always that it's possible. 
Yes, that's that's it. As someone from a Roman Catholic family, I can I can kind of <laughs> relate to the impact of, of Catholicism, the world, re the wide reaching impact of, of Catholicism. Um, I think I actually I had a specific question for. Um, well, actually, no, I guess I can kind of ask this for everybody, like, I guess, well, Marshall, you kind of touched upon, you know, kind of your experience when you were kind of navigating the asexual community and then you kind of noticed that there was racism in this particular group and no one really did anything about it. And then they created a, a kind of a black ace space somewhere else. Um, I was curious to know if anyone else, have, like, I, I mean, I can 100% say I've encountered racism within the ace community. I didn't in the beginning. And then it just kind of started to kind of creep up over time and it actually creeps up more often than I tell people it creeps up. Cause I know if I say it too much, they're gonna say I've got a chip on my shoulder. So I can only mention it on a kind of every monthly basis, but it's definitely something I continuously um, stumble across. But I was definitely curious about kind of how how everyone's kind of, I guess for, for Lohan being someone who's in a kind of more diverse country um, with a more diverse scene, it's probably a bit different, but maybe for Sharonda and Marshall, kind of how's it been like kind of navigating the ace community and these ace spaces, not only I guess as, as black people, but also people that you can actually type in your name in and see a face. Whereas for a lot of other people, they might just be an avatar. So <laughs> kind of raceless, but probably white avatar. It's definitely it's definitely like navigating Pennsylvania as a whole, where Pennsylvania is predominantly white, but it's like only in the cities where it, you get like a diverse range of people. Um, um, it's it reminds me of growing up in Pennsylvania when navigating a spaces because it's kind of like it's it's like seventy five or over percent like white and and you don't you don't meet a lot of people with the same similar experience as um as you and it's you get a constant remind you get a constant rem rem reminder of of that um where someone did uh, excuse the most likely uh, behind me but um. Someone did use a racial, uh, a outdated racial term towards me, and they were very like, "Why didn't you inbox me to correct this?" I'm kind of like, "Because you said it publicly, I'm going to address you publicly." But <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like, I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be settled with you if you come, if you use a outdated term towards me, um, or towards my community, and it's just like, a lot of white ace people don't understand that. We have we have to navigate when we come into these spaces. We not only have to navigate ace phobia, or I mean, like, uh, we have to navigate racism, like in terms of independent spaces. And it's just like, and when you, when when um, we go in these groups, when admins don't do anything, that's that becomes an issue. And you wonder why people leave your group. It's because we don't feel included in these groups. And it's and sadly that was one of my again, um, like I said before, that was my early year experiences um after it came out after it came out with AIDS. So it's kinda like it gave me flashbacks to again navigating Pennsylvania as a black person um period. But I do see I I am happy that there are spaces that we are leading um in community and I hope it grows um because it's we do need spaces where we could express ourselves without uh, the expectation of us being um gas gaslighted. Sharon, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, massage noir is a hell of a drug. People love it. They refuse to let go of it. And of course, you are familiar with this, Yasmin. One of our first interactions with each other was me coming to your defense on Twitter because you said a true thing. <laughs> And that true thing made a lot of white asexuals uncomfortable. And then they proceeded to spend the rest of the evening trying to make you responsible for their discomfort. And it made me so upset. Um, the thing is that when you are a black woman or if you are perceived as a black woman, regardless of what your gender is, doesn't matter what you say or how nicely you say it or how true it is, there will always be a reaction from someone who tries to turn you into the villain or tries to turn you into someone who is too incompetent or too uneducated to know what you are talking about. And I mean, this is our reality, both in and out of asexual communities and spaces. And as someone who has been active online and writing for years, um, 
I'm always being challenged or whatever I say, even though I like religiously cite my sources. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm always being challenged. And a lot of that is because people are so used to disagreeing or trying to silence anything that a black person pursued as a woman says. Um, <laughs> sorry, so I just got a Skype call me like this is not okay. fine. <laughs> no, okay. um, and I'm the other side of that is that when I do have people, especially white people, who appreciate what I have to say. I get a lot of white aces in my inbox asking me for emotional labor and asking me to hold their feelings. And I simply refuse to do that. Um, I mean, not necessarily as a political stance that is this part of it, but the part of it is that I simply just don't want to, and I'm not going to, because I, I don't write for white people. I write for black liberation first and foremost. And if you happen to learn something from it, great but it's not for you i write for black people i think it's interesting because i always feel like within the ace community if someone says something that seems even slightly ace phobic everyone's on it if they say something that sounds slightly this they're on it they are very our community is very good at noticing anything that seems like a microaggression until it's race related and then all of a sudden everyone's confused and that's something I've, i always feel like if we could just keep that same energy you had towards that random person tweeting something that sounded a little ace phobic and keep yeah. that towards someone else saying something racist, then that would be that would be great because you have the energy. Yeah. It's just not directed in all the right all the places mm -hmm. all the time. Um, I, by the important. way, guys, I think if anyone has their questions to send in, now would probably be a good time to send those in, and then we can put them up on the screen and ask everybody. But for all of you, if you had to give like a, a not, not going into labor, but if we had to give some kind of tip to people within the ace community to kind of hopefully combat some of the issues that it has particularly race related what would be your like sentence for them sentence just like just one <laughs> i think we can do a, we can do a whole we can do a whole tech talk on it but I, that would be long <laughs> listen here's the thing the unfortunate truth is that things are not significantly going to change until white people start caring enough mm -hmm. that's the truth because it's never the job of the oppressed to end the oppression. White people have to start caring. They have to start committing to examining their own anti-blackness and then making tangible changes to make a spaces better for black people. Definitely. Marshall, did you have any? Yeah, uh, it's just like, um, just like, um, I just wish people would share or like share our work like donate to our causes um like everyone else's um because it's kind of like i do feel like we our work is perceived as not palatable palatable enough for our community so it's just like um uh, it's just the expectation of we have to constantly do this for um constantly do this um like without any some sort of like uh recognition or any like payment or something it's just like it's very exhausting um but it's just like, um, I mean, share our work, like not not just uh, listen to our voices and don't over talk us. I've literally only just seen that we were putting the questions into the banner section and not into the chat section. So that okay, so there have been. But fortunately, we've kind of answered a lot of them, um, just in our in our conversation in general. Um, but the, here's one that I think we could probably go for. What can non-Black Aces do to support Black Aces about speaking over them or tokenizing them? Tokenizing is an interesting one. I feel like I've definitely noticed um, that phenomenon. Um, I feel like if people want to do a tokenizing, I feel like they either pick me or Marshall on Twitter if they want to suddenly show they're inclusive, all of a sudden they'll retweet us and do nothing else. Um, so, but what are your thoughts on that one to everybody? I mean, all these white lid ace orgs have to step up and they have to start talking about racism and anti-blackness. They have to start hosting conversations about it. And I don't mean just when 
um, it comes up in conversation or just when we are in the midst of uprisings, like you have to start actively taking initiative to have these conversations because you know that there's racism and anti-blackness going on in, inside of your organization and you're just not doing anything about it. And they have to commit to making tangible changes, starting with putting people of color in leadership roles, especially black and indigenous folks and not tokenizing them. That's a good point. And also not asking them to be mules to hold everything. And all these aces who have huge platforms, who have grown their platforms by saying a lot of the same things that aces of color have been saying, and sometimes not even going as deeply as we do, they also have to start doing this shit. Like they have to start using, sorry, can we curse? Go <laughs> okay. <for it>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But they have to start using their platforms to talk about these things um, instead of just talking about the same basic asexual one on one things every day. Um, yeah. Take uh, initiative. There are just there has to be commitment from white people. They have to start interrogating their own anti blackness and racism. That's the only way that spaces are going to be more safe for us and for other people of color. And also, they have to be willing to hear when they are wrong. That's important. And they have to be willing to correct it because when they are the ones who are upholding anti-blackness, they're the ones who have to work to eradicate it. And they have to stop expecting us to educate them on their terms because they all that always turns into tone policing and it also always turns into painting us as the aggressors. Um, but another thing is that educating people about anti-blackness is not everyone's ministry. And that needs to be known that it's okay. There are a lot of black aces who are willing and ready and very passionate about talking about anti-blackness and educating people about it. And then there are black aces who just want to exist and mind their business and do nothing but be black and die. And that's okay too. <laughs> Don't go and demand an education for someone who never offered it to you. Yeah, that is definitely something. Uh, that's everything you just said, which is like, just like a religious experience to me because it's kind of like i it's just like be, like if like what you asked me in the experience um i was saying earlier where as a lot of like white activists love to share my work but at the same time they don't want to they don't want to have those conversations um around our experiences like we are supposed to be like we're supposed to have, like i guys i posted many times on on twitter where it takes more than putting blm on your on your on your <laughs> um on your thing on your account yeah right and what's and what's sad is also after what happened with last year in 2020 throughout the summer a lot of people remains a lot of people are going going silent now about conversations about race and um and it's not and it's, it doesn't stop at the ace community either because it's just like it's the tumbleweed city but in regards to um the discussion of racism in the community um and it's it's exhausting it's tiring and every day like I, it's it might sound bad, but I get tired of like feeling like I don't, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm heard because it feels like my work's not um, palatable because I speak about my intersectionality. Intersectionality. I mean, I did a whole interview not too long ago in, in the winter where someone was like, "Why is he? Why is he doing uh, an arrow like an Ace and Arrow uh, uh, video with um, someone outside the community?" I'm Ace and Arrow, uh, and comes to find out that. Most I get I guess the issue was that a lot of my work, a lot of the um, video was also talking about BLM and being a black asexual activist. Like, I'm sorry, but that's just for like as long as I'm, I'm alive, my activism is always going to be staying on the intersection of black asexuality. It's, and I'm not apologizing for it. <laughs> it is, it's like I am personally trying very hard to bite my tongue because all of the things that we're talking about, I could spill some tea and cause absolute chaos because there's been so much stuff happening very recently that actually <laughs> entirely relates to all of these things. But I would cause absolute chaos if I said it, so I won't. But I will say that all of these things that we've been talking about is very much still an issue. And the mm -hmm. reason why I can't just openly say, oh, this happens or this happens is because again, I would be framed as the as the aggressor in a scenario if I was to say something, but these things definitely, and I think one thing is important to also with black people say like, this is a thing that's happening and you're white and you haven't even experienced racism like that. Don't say, actually, I don't believe that happened. From my white perspective, I don't think that was a thing. 
Because I, 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 I see people in the ACE community that love to tell me what does and doesn't happen, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, but looking at, I feel like, did we have an hour? Let me, let me throw in a positive. Of, oh, Lohan's back. Oh, is, there we go. There we go. Um, I think, actually, this one's, I don't even know how entirely relevant this is, but it's, it's kind of relevant, sort of, because it's kind of on the topic of hypersexualization. But I feel like one thing people need to remember when it comes to kind of judging black musicians or hip hop musicians or black women in hip hop and the kind of, you know, the hypersexualization in their music is also remembering who chooses what they get to do. It's not always, the agency isn't always entirely with the art. I mean, I think we would love, all love to see more black girls standing there in a track suit like Billie Eilish, but they don't often get the opportunity to do that because if they're not twerking, they're not selling. And according to the people at the top of those labels, which is often not always black people or black women. So I think that's something to keep in mind. But um, I know, did anyone else have anything to add to that? I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, kind of um, I think we have to be careful about um, that because and this is one of my pet peeves, this idea that black music is the only genre, or well, black people invented all genres of music, let's be clear, except uh -huh. for white supremacist music. But um, <laughs> that rap and hip hop are the only genres of music that are hypersexualized because that's not true. Another thing is that there are black artists who make music that aren't hypersexualized. There's this black aromantic singer whose name I can never remember, but it's- Is it Moses? Name. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, a black a romantic singer. Yeah, Moses. Um, yeah, they released an album like a year or two ago that was uh, about their a romanticism, where they you know, like explored it pretty deeply. I just think you need to do what you can to find black artists who talk about and sing about the things that you want to hear about. But also, like, if you want to listen to Billie Eilish or whoever else, I, I personally, I don't care. I don't give a single <laughs> fuck who you listen to. <laughs> you also don't have to tell people you listen to white music if you don't want to. Yes, Moses Sumney, somebody put it in the comments. Yes. Um, yeah, listen to whatever makes you happy and whatever feels authentic to you. But also don't think that black people only make music about sex, because that's not true. Unfortunately, it just so happens that when it comes to what charts through for, through external forces, that's the one that might that might make the top list. But there are some of you can I mean I like I like heavy metal. I like death metal stuff. There are some great black heavy metal singers out there and they're not talking about sex. And that's rock is a black genre, heavy metal is a black genre as far as I'm concerned. So mm -hmm. there is a lot you can uh there's definitely a lot out there, but unfortunately the way our media works, they have a preference for how they want black people to be represented. So they only want to kind of boost up a kind of certain image and then, mm -hmm. but there's definitely a lot of black artists out there that are getting something. It's, def it's definitely giving me a flashback because this is actually one of the reason why I can't confront the people in this group because it was white ace people having conversations around black music. And I'm like, wait, I'm kind of like, wait a minute, why are y'all centering yourselves in this conversation? Because it's just like it's not your place and that's when that's why that question it's a good question but it really drew me back to that moment where i went off on this on this person this group yeah can i volunteer somebody not me though volunteer somebody to just make a black ace arrow playlist and, sh and make it public <laughs> go go do that so I mean, it, it just about like what genres you listen. I mean, as I said, as someone who listens to heavy metal, it's very easy to avoid sexual themes. <laughs> if you pick a death metal song, it probably won't come up. So it kind of depends on what your kind of what kind of vibe you're into. But I think yeah. this is a quite a nice one to, I guess, potentially end on. Um, I, I think this one's kind of probably a nice one because I think we're approaching the end of our thing. So I feel like an hour, right? So what is your most recent experience of Black Ace Joy? Um, I guess this panel. Um, <laughs> like I said, I know quite a few aces, but I don't think I've ever been in a room with this many Black Aces at once. So this is pretty cool. 
Yeah. yeah, I feel like Zoe Haas has probably has to be my most recent experience, <laughs> given that we've been in a pandemic and I haven't seen that many people. <laughs> so this probably has to be my most recent experience as well, especially with everything that's been going on behind the scenes recently. Like it has been incredibly exhausting. So this has been very cathartic to get to hear other Black Ace people talking about these same things. Uh, um, what about you, Marshall and Mohani? I went to a uh, picnic thrown by the asexual goddess in Chicago, where we Ooh, actually cool. really had like a skyline view of the city, and we had like a small picnic of our small vaccinated friends, and I actually got to meet, uh, well, asexual goddess the first time in person and another black ace person. So it was on uh, this po this panel too is my recent, but that also was one of my um, like very recent like. Black Ace Joy um, moments. As long as you're still going to have offline versions of those. Mm -hmm. oh. What about you, Lohan? Yeah, for me is um, finally find a person that respects me as a Ace person and that don't want to have sex with me all the time just because I'm a Black woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome, and that definitely, definitely counts. I think, I think we're, I mean, we're, we've reached an hour, so I'm pretty sure that it's probably time to wrap it up, but yeah, I think we technically overran by 10 minutes. Sorry, it's been fun. I'm sure you guys don't mind. Um, <laughs> um, but thank you again, everybody, for tuning in in the audience. And thank you, of course, to all of our panelists for taking an hour out of your day, which was supposed to be 45 minutes, I've just remembered, to, <laughs> to be part of this panel. Um, thank you so much for all sharing your experience. Um, where can people find you if they want to find you again? Um, you can find me on Twitter at Sharonda J. Brown, Instagram at the same handle. You can find you can find me on Twitter at Gentle Giant Ace and YouTube at Marshall John Blunt. Y'all can find me on Instagram. It's Lohani underline XX. And you guys probably know where to find me by now. So thank you all for watching and thank you all for coming. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. So bye everybody. <laughs> bye. Bye. <laughs>